creativity. It's, it's what brings us here today, right? That's why we're all here. It's what makes life interesting and fun, and it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. It's what propels us forward as an entire society, like major human breakthroughs, as well as everyday magical delight are all brought to us by creativity. But I need to preface this talk by saying I don't think there is one creativity. Like, I think everybody has their own version. My creativity is different from yours and yours and yours. And our challenge as human beings on this planet is to recognize each other's creativity and appreciate it and then let us go to work with what we have and what our own creative energy is and like just wor work as a collective group to recognize, understand, and appreciate each other's creativity. My own version of creativity, I'll tell you a little bit about it, it's very much in the moment. Like, I'm not a big planner. Um, I don't like thinking ahead too far. I want to take exactly what's happening right now. I want to take all my skills and all the materials at hand and find a solution at this moment with my creativity. That might sound familiar to you because I've actually been compared on a creative level to this guy. This is MacGyver. And uh, while we do share similar hairstyles, <laughs> right? It's like my, my sunglasses look more like this. And if instead of whatever that missile thing is, I would probably be toting a confetti cannon. <laughs> so MacGyver might give himself five minutes to defuse a bomb, and he has a paper clip and a piece of chewing gum and a rubber band. And I instead will give myself one hour to get to a Halloween party. And all I have at my disposal are two takeout containers, a pair of old reading glasses, and a green hoodie. Or maybe I decide that I really, and I'll tell you why later, but I really need to dress like a traditional Swiss Appenzeller. And so I scout out a plastic cow, saw it in half with a bread knife, paint it gold, glue it onto a ribbon, because this is what a traditional Swiss Appenzeller dresses like. I was labeled creative from a very early age, and I'm not sure if it was because I did something weird in kindergarten one day, like, um, you know, like ate paste a different way from the other kids, and that some adult said, well, isn't that creative? And I just really liked that, that like, positive affirmation and kept going for it. Um, it could have been because I had a s ridiculously supportive mom who's here in the audience, talk about supportive, um, and she let me cover our house, right? Give it up for my mom. She's <laughs> You know, she let me cover the house in, like, I, I can't even think what, like, paint, glitter, everything. Our entire garage was my art studio, so that could have, like, let, contributed to my creativity. Maybe I had, like, a little bit of a natural inclination. It's probably, like, some combination of all of these things. So I decided that I would study design and enter the workforce as a creative professional. And I realized a little ways into this, that um, nothing zaps your creativity quite like adding the word professional. <laughs> right? I spent the first decade of my career like learning to meet deadlines and manage people's expectations and be, you know, all official and fit into this professional mold. And I took everything that as a kid, as a young adult, like made me me and special and creative. I just took all that stuff and I just shoved it into like the dark corner, darkest corner I could find, and I became this person. Um, you know, and I and I was good at it and I was successful. And meanwhile, I was kind of also miserable. And I came to a decision one day, and it wasn't like overnight or anything. It came after watching a lot of TED Talks and talking with a lot of people who happen to be my friends but are much smarter than I am. And I realized that if I was going to be happy, and let's like get past happiness, if I was even going to have a chance at contributing something to society, it was going to be because I got back to what was me. I found that creativity. I found that spark. And I brought it out of the corner, invited it into the center of the room, 
and ask it if it wanted to have a party. <laughs> and that's, that's what I did. I, I said, hey, come on, let's have a party together. It's you and me, like, let's figure this out. And I've been doing that for about two years now. Um, it, ha it happens to coincide with my 30th birthday. So I'm now 32. Like the last two years have really been um, the beginning of, I hope, a decade of creativity. And it is still a challenge, though. I just wanted you to know, like, you just don't, like, become overnight super in tune with your creativity. You have to work at it. And I still get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, okay, creativity. It's you and me today, and we're going to rock this. We've got this. And I think that creativity is fickle, and you can't just call it on command. It's not like flipping a switch. Or m maybe it is. Um, I think Cassie was the one who said that, um, you know, if somebody could figure out how to make a switch for creativity, she could market that and make a bunch of money. And um, that's actually what my talk is about. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, call me the most naive person on the planet, but I think there is a switch. All right, well, maybe not just one switch. Like, there's also some knobs and some dials. It's like I have this whole panel for creativity. And if I could just get it tuned right, then I can set myself on a course for creativity for the day. So uh, I, again, want to say this is for me, not for you. you got to figure out your own. But I think, you know, this might be some, there might be some, some truths in there that you could suss out some information for yourself. So if you would like me to, I could share my settings with you. Would you like this? Yeah. Okay, good. Otherwise, the talk would be over. It'd be like, okay, we're done. <laughs> so without further ado, with much pomp and circumstance, please let me present settings for creativity and general awesomeness in life as they apply specifically to me, but also might have some universal truths for you. Imagine, if you will, the inside of my brain. <laughs> it is a rainbow. It is a rainbow in there. And the first setting that I like to focus on is called self-expression. And you'll notice that my dials go up to 11. Has anybody seen Spinal Tap? <laughs> right? I mean, let's be honest. Anything worth doing is worth doing to 11. So I like to keep this guy turned all the way up. So if I'm given the choice between fitting in and being myself. I am going to set it to do my best to stay true to myself. And the challenge for that, for me, is all about differentiating what is really going on with me and what I think other people think should be going on with me. That's really far removed, but that's it, isn't it? Like a lot of times, we're caught up in this idea that other people have this idea for how we should be living. I'm trying to separate the two. Self-expression is all about getting what's going on in here and in here out there. But that can sound and feel a little bit selfish. And I've had a setting to deal with this and so my special output is for others. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I work with an amazing group of creative professionals in a co-working space in Brooklyn. It's called Studio Mates. And one of my studio mates, this is Cameron, and it's his birthday today. He's right front and center. And Cameron is known for always wearing a blue plaid shirt, jeans, flip-flops, carrying a notebook right here, smoking a pipe, and being on Scotchkins. Scotchkins is Cameron's version of the Atkins diet, where he eats a lot of meat and spinach, but also drinks a lot of scotch and whiskey. <laughs> and Public service announcement, uh, the Surgeon General has not approved this diet, but it's a big part of what makes Cameron Cameron. And so we wanted to celebrate this on his big day. We all dress like him, as suggested by my studio mate. And then I made these little party cups to drink our celebratory whiskey that looked like pipes, just out of some paper. Like I said, I had 30 minutes, so I did it. And then we made a cake out of meat and spinach. And I got to be me and totally self-expressive by celebrating what made Cameron Cameron. 
Remember this guy, the Swiss Appenzeller, I told you I'd tell you why. Well, my studio mate Tina, my Swiss studio mate Tina, was having a party and said that it would really make her day if they, she could just get a traditional Swiss Appenzeller. This is how they dress in her hometown, um, you know, traditionally. If, if only one would just surprise and show up at the party. So that's totally worth staying up until 2 in the morning to do, right? <laughs> <laughs> to saw that cow in half and burn my arm with a glue gun because it totally made her day. <laughs> so the hardest part about wearing these crazy outfits and making people eat cake that's made out of meat is that you're going to get your fair share of criticism. You're going to get the eye rollers. You're going to get the underminers. Haters are going to hate. Um, <laughs> But the hardest critic that I always have to deal with is the one that's in my head. It's that little voice who's like, really, who do you think you are? Are you really prepared to look like a complete idiot today? And so I do my best to keep both the external and the internal set to mute. So now I've got self-expression taken care of. I move over to enthusiasm. I don't know if you know this about me, but I try to keep this one on 11 as well. <laughs> and when I'm trying to imagine how to do this, I have role models. You might have heard of them. They're called the Muppets. <laughs> Who loves the Muppets? I mean, really, is there anything better than the Muppets? They will just, they are happy, they are together, they are a team, they will laugh, they will skip, they will dance at the drop of a hat. And I have this fantasy that I am on my way to work and walking into the corner store for a quart of OJ is a Muppet. Like it is not any big thing that there would just be a Muppet there, you know, while I am passing by on the street. And since this is my dream, I decided that I wanted to create a world that would be worthy of a Muppet just walking by. And so I always try to keep that in mind as I'm going through my day. So if it's like an opportunity to just stare at somebody or to smile at them, I'm going to smile. You know, it's like stay away or get involved, I'm going to participate. I know it's super cool to like act like you don't care about anything, but I'm going to turn my setting to like really try to feel what other people are going through. Dance? What do you think? Of course I'm going to dance. I'm going to sing with my eyes closed, and I'm going to laugh until it hurts. And instead of asking why, why, like trying to justify every little action with a like, good reason, I'm just going to start saying, why not? If it brings a little bit of joy and happiness into the world seriously, why not? The hardest setting for me is this one. It's trust. And um, I try to keep it on 11. But when I can't, I remember this guy. He's a pretty big hero, right? And he gave a commencement address in 2005 to the graduating class at Stanford. And in it, he talked about connecting the dots. He talked about the story of dropping out of college and not having a clue what he was doing, but going around and auditing courses just because they sounded interesting to him. So he took calligraphy, which is something that like a young Steve Jobs had no business to take. But at the time, he was like all worried and he just kept going and decided he had to trust. And once he designed the Macintosh, it all came into play. That calligraphy class informed the way that he put typography on the personal computer. And he said that looking forward, there's no way, there's no way to be able to connect those dots. You can only connect them looking back. So you really just have to trust. I still have no idea what all these things that I love have to do with anything. I don't know what getting up here on the stage is about, or like my love of color, my love of outfits, my love of weird costumes, like, does that make any sense? No, but I just have to trust that I'll be able to connect the dots. Worrying is my favorite pastime, and I love to worry about the future. Not the future like um, robots are gonna take over the planet and we'll all be serving a galactic overlord. Like the future like, is this path is this the right path? Am I doing the right thing? Am I making the right decision? And I just have to go back to Steve and connecting the dots, keep my worry turned off, and when I do, I live in this perpetual state of gratitude. Like, my life is pretty freaking amazing. I 
I am surrounded by amazing relationships, community, I get a great job, all, all of the people, the city that I live in, everything astounds me when I keep this setting right. And then I get to decide for myself that it's all going to be freaking amazing. The last setting that I have that's the most important one to me, of course, is color. I don't know if I've mentioned, but I kind of like color. <laughs> color, the reason that I got to keep this one turned all the way up, I, 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 I've said this before, but I feel as though it is physiologically impossible to be in a bad mood when you're wearing bright red pants. And why is that important? Well, if you're happy, you're going to attract other happy people to you. And that seems like a good justification for color. This is one other amazing example. This is the favela of Santa Marta in Rio de Janeiro. And the favelas are not known for places um, with a lot of community pride. They're known for drugs. They're known for crime. They're known for poverty. But when two international artists came in and convinced this, the residents here to work with them on a painting project to transform their town square, they were able to gain global press and brought recognition to their community, gained that sense of pride, brought um, people to understand what their plight was, and really what made that difference, it was color. There's a lot of studies that talk about the impact of color. There's like, you know, red, if you're in the presence of red, you'll be much more, um, you'll perform better on tasks that require analytical judgment skills, and um, creative skills when you're in the presence of blue. So like color actually impacts us in ways that we're not even conscious of. So I think that's a pretty good reason to keep it, to keep it turned on. My favorite color is rainbow. I don't know if I've mentioned this. My friends decided to throw a rainbow birthday party for me, and this is a testament to me starting to live my life creatively because they picked up on the fact that I was really into color in these secondhand outfits. And they said everybody should come dress head to toe in one color, and we're going to have a rainbow birthday for Jesse. But what color was I going to be? I didn't know. I love every color. So I spent the night in my closet and ended up with actually 11 different outfits and brought them to work the next day. And my friends, instead of laughing at me, much to their credit, decided to capture this and turn it into a website. And this was the first rainbow birthday. This was my 31st birthday. This started me blogging. It's called Lucky So-and-So. I told you I was pretty lucky, right? And this is just all about secondhand outfits, color, all the important stuff in life. And then it came time for my 32nd birthday. And my friends came again, and they were all dressed in their colors. But I had gotten it into my head, the setting was why not, that we should have a parade, a rainbow birthday parade. And that's what we did. It happened to be pouring down rain this day, which made what we were doing even that much more absurd. But if you'll note the gigantic smile on my face, I have never felt more absurd and at once more myself than when I was in front of this marching band in this parade. And I swear there were Muppets. You can't see them here, but they were. And the Times covered it. And it's really hard for me to describe this transformative effect of the Rainbow Birthday Parade. So I thought, if you were into it, we would have a Rainbow Parade here right now. Does that sound good? <laughs> OK, but before we can get started, I have to get you to do some of my settings, right? So like, let's get all this adjusted. The most important one is if you have a dial that is for like, think this is lame or have fun, please switch it over to have fun. <laughs> right now, let's switch it. OK. And now I just need a little bit of participation from the audience. So can I get a show of hands if you would like to participate in something called a Rainbow Birthday Parade? <laughs> now, I need you to, to arrange yourself chromatically. <laughs> this is going to get a little chaotic. Now your job is to take whatever's in this bag and put it on your body or play it as an instrument. Nothing can be left in the bag. Go. Thank you very much. And while we're doing that, I have to bring up the most important element of the rainbow birthday, which is the birthday. 
And I don't know if you guys remember from earlier today, but we actually have a birthday in the audience. A Mr. Almost 88 years old. Can we get Mr. Burt Roper up here? <laughs> come right here, yeah, come right here. Now, Bert, oh my gosh, 88 years wise. This is our baton. Oh my gosh. And I'll just show you how I like to do it. This is how I did it in the pictures. Okay, so I just take it and hold it, and then I just kind of, you know, give it a little, you know how, how it would go, right? Exactly. <laughs> Very good. Oh, here we go. Here comes Bert. <laughs>